Testing and logging on production are two different things. And in general, testing on production is a bad idea. And logging on production can be really badly implemented. Both can lead to really nasty consequences, including the ones that come with GDPR. Watch my video where I'll show you how you can stop testing on production and how you can start logging properly on production. It's 2024 and you could ask yourself, are people still doing this? Are they really still testing on production? Yes, they are. Why they are doing this? Well, first of all, there could be cost constraints. That means nobody's willing to pay for it. Then, of course, we have time constraints, and that means deadlines. Yes, that's exactly when things should have been ready for yesterday. Then we have lack of expertise. Unfortunately, a lot of developers don't know how to use Docker or other tools, so they cannot actually support themselves and build development slash test environments. And then we have the last one, and it's usually happening on the company level. They are actually misunderstanding the risk of testing on production. Honestly, they think things cannot go bad, and usually they go. What can go wrong? Well, you can actually start a chain reaction. That means, in the first place, your reputation might suffer. If you do it really badly, then of course GDPR can kick in, because you might actually cause a data leak. Why? Well, think about the first part, losing reputation. If you actually make it so that you stop your website, or you present some dumb debugging messages to your customers, this can actually yeah, make you look very unserious. And if you make it like really good, and you expose some data, or you expose some credentials to other systems, that might, leak to a date, uh, that might lead to a data leak. And of course, this can have further consequences, especially in terms of GDPR. And if you ask me, does it really happen these days? Well, not so long ago, it happened that actually some of the guys published by mistake some debugging data on a production website, and it contained credentials to a staging database system. Apparently, the same password uh, worked for the production database. You can imagine what happened next. Can you actually build a test slash dev environment very quickly? Yes, you can. You just have to use tools like Docker. You can use Vagrant, you can use Lando. There's actually plenty of products available online where you can actually very quickly build test environments. Of course, if you would like to have full control over your data and you, in case you don't want it to leave your premises, then of course I recommend using Docker or if you need to kind of virtualize something which cannot be dockerized or containerized, then go with VirtualBox. But this way you can actually build and replicate your production environment. And I can tell you, on my laptop, I have several of those. And it just takes one command to bring them up. Docker Compose App. Okay, so you created your test slash dev environment. What to do next? Well, you have to fancy yourself. That means that you have to make sure that even if a mistake happens and you actually end up sending an email or a message to a customer, it will land in a thing like, for example, mail trap. So the whole point is you should isolate your system so that you can never generate any communication that will go to the end customer. If you have partners that you work with, you can of course make additional tricks. You can make sure that you can, for example, consume the API, but read only. Put and post delete methods, they can just, you know, do something else. Yes, it creates a little bit of extra work, but believe me, this will actually pay itself off every single day you use it. How about the database? Well, sometimes you, of course, need to generate data. And for that purpose, I'm recommending a library which is called Faker. This way, you can actually generate tons of quality fake data and populate slash seed your database. In a situation where you have to use production database, well, I definitely recommend adding additional step. That means, well, for sure, scramble all the emails and change all the names so that if something really bad happens, at least those people cannot be identified directly. 
This also means that in case you forgot about the first step, meaning using, for example, MailTrap instead of your real SMTP server, those emails will be delivered to some coconut at coconut.dk. So yeah, from that point of view, that works really well. But what if you actually need to be able to use your production data and still count on the properties that come with the data? Because a lot of bugs, they actually are caused by data. Well, then I recommend that you take a look on a project which is called Anonymatron. It actually allows you to scramble your data and it keeps the properties of the original product data, but it kind of like gets you much closer to the GDPR. If you play it well, you can actually hit two birds with one stone in this situation. Why? Well, if you actually add an animatron or you write your own script or you use a different project that is gonna help you keep your data, you know, GDPR okay in test environments, then you can actually consume your database backups and use them for your staging slash dev slash test environments. This way you can for free verify them. Why am I mentioning this? Because in all the teams I've been working with, this way we've been always, always actually catching any problems with the backup system. Because the developers were complaining. They were saying like, hey, oh, we are missing half of the tables. We are missing two tables. We are missing data in that table. Somehow this is not working the right way. And yes, it happened a few times probably four or five in the past six years, but we caught them. And believe me, having good backups, that's the number one thing you should have control of. So what's the strategy when it comes to actually putting the data on developers' computers? You have two options. Of course, they can always, you know, consume the backups themselves, or you can actually pre-process them, which is gonna be a little bit better so that they can download dumps and read them in on their machines. But of course, this is gonna waste a lot of time. You can also spin up a database, which is properly secured online and use SSH and establish tunnels so that they can consume one or several test databases. Of course, you can also use replication and thousands of other smart ideas, but this way you can actually save a lot of time. And if you automate this, then you're going to get a fresh dev slash test database every morning. And here comes the anti-pattern. When can you actually test on production? In a situation when everything is dead and you cannot wait for the new deployment to kick in, because then the risk of waiting is actually higher than the risk of breaking. Sometimes I'm actually recommending that it's okay to add extra logging directly on production without waiting for the next deployment. But this is something we usually do when we can easily replicate the error and there is almost no people on the website. It's not about to be 100% religious and strict. It's about adapting and calculating the risk associated with the changes you're about to make. And of course, once you're ready with the monkey business you've been doing on production, then you redeploy to, of course, you know, recreate the status quo. If you don't have deployments, especially zero downtime deployments, then oh, take a look on my video where I discuss the importance of them. Uh, there is at least two of them. One about removing the snowflakes, one about, you know, the DevOps practices that really work for me. But believe me, zero downtime deployments, automation around this point, priceless. If you need help with your test and logging strategy, then remember this code, opportunity, because this way you can actually buy a one or two hour consultation with me at half the price.